Hi, I'm Pastor Bill Wendell. Welcome to our online worships this week. As you can tell, we have the sanctuary and a lot of the rest of the church decorated because we are in the season of Advent. We're so happy that you are choosing to spend your time with us, and we hope that as we go through Advent together, we can look forward to the arrival of the coming of the Christ child. If you'd like information about any of the great things that are going on here at Thoburn, click the link below. One thing that's going to be going on coming up really soon here is a live nativity here, outside, here at the church in the parking lot on December 19th. That's Saturday, December 19th. Check out the details below. At this time, let us prepare our hearts and prepare our minds for a time of worship. chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. Luke chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them, and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. All who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, 
which were just as they had been told. Please pray with me. Loving Father, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to worship you and, and praise you. Please allow us to humble our hearts before you so that we can be open. Open to your guidance, open to your encouragement, open to you challenging us to become who you've created us to be. Lord, I am a broken and I am a sinful man. So my prayer is that you would get me out of the way. Get me out of the way so that your words of hope, your words of peace, your words of life transforming love would come through me so that we would all be transformed by your power. So Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditation of all of our hearts be found loving and acceptable to you. Lord, you're our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This Advent, we are doing a series entitled The Misfits of Christmas. It's inspired by the popular kids movie Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and the Island of Misfit Toys in that movie. In the movie, the island is filled with misfit toys like a toy train that has square wheels in the caboose, a cowboy that rides an ostrich instead of a horse, and a squirt gun that can only shoot jelly. All of these toys are unwanted by the little girls and little boys, but King Moonracer is willing to give them all a place to belong. In reality, all of us have felt like misfits at one time or another. We have all felt as if we just have no place to belong. Through this series, we're going to consider the misfits in the Christmas story. We're going to discover that God used, loved, and welcomed misfits to announce and to live out the coming of his son. And by studying these misfits of long ago, we're going to discover that God still uses misfits today. He loves, he welcomes, and he uses misfits to proclaim his love to this world. Now, whenever I think about misfits, I think about a man who came to church in his overalls. This guy comes to church in his overalls, and as you can imagine, this caused quite a commotion. So much so that the pastor came up to him and said, you know, we should really talk to Jesus about what you should wear when coming to this church. Well, sure enough, the next week the man showed up in his overalls again, next Sunday. The pastor was so disturbed by this, he, he said, did you ask Jesus what you should wear when you come to this church? The man said, yeah, I asked him, but unfortunately he said he doesn't know. You see, Jesus has never been invited to this church before. Now, this joke makes me wonder, who is it that the Lord welcomes into his presence? And, and who is it that we should welcome into our presence? In our reading out of Luke, we find God welcoming shepherds into his presence. Welcoming shepherds to be the first ones, the first human beings, to experience the newborn Son of God. Now, God, being the creator of the universe, could have had anyone visit the newborn baby. I mean, you could have had the Roman government come and visit Jesus. You should, could have sent angels to help people, officials of the Roman government. I mean, after all, that's the reason why Joseph and Mary were in Bethlehem in the first place. Caesar had ordered a census. God could have also sent angels to the religious authorities. That seems like an appropriate group of people to come and meet the newborn Son of God. And finally, God could have sent the angels to the innkeepers, or more likely the owners of the home, where Joseph and Mary came, and they wanted to find lodging, but it was too full. So why does God welcome these shepherds? What was it that was different about them? How were they different from the Roman government, from the religious authorities at the time, and also from the folks at the end? Let's consider each of these groups in turn. So why not the Roman government? I mean, they could have announced the coming of the king with style, with all the pomp and circumstance that he really deserves. But, you know, I think it was because their hearts were in the wrong place. As I mentioned before, there was a census going on. You see, Caesar Augustus was counting his treasures. He was too busy building his kingdom. 
And we live in a culture that encourages this, right? It encourages kingdom building. Cassian Crowns wrote a song entitled The American Dream. Part of it goes like this. All work and no play has made Jack a dull boy. But all work and no God has left Jack with a lost soul. But he's moving on full steam. He's chasing the American dream. He wants to give his family the finer things. The chorus goes like this. And he works and he builds with his own two hands. And he pours all he has into a castle made of sand. But the wind and the rain come crashing in. And only time will tell just how long his kingdom stands. When considering the powerful and the wealthy among us, does building their kingdom really bring them peace? Does it really bring them wholeness? Around the time my grandfather died, Dean Martin also died. My dad made some interesting observations about the two men and their deaths. You see, one similarity is that both Dean Martin and my grandfather were sick for a long time. So when they died, everyone, of course, was sad, but no one was shocked. A difference, an obvious difference, was Dean's fame. Everyone loved Dino, right? He had amassed a great deal of fame and fortune, quite a kingdom. My grandfather, on the other hand, he, he was a Goodyear man. He, he loved working with his hands. Always had enough money to feed his family and keep a roof over their heads, but other than that, really didn't have two pennies to rub together. But the difference that, that my dad thought was the most striking is in how they died. As I mentioned, Dean Martin had been sick for a long time, and he died on Christmas morning. You see, everyone knew that this would probably be Dean's last Christmas, yet he died in his home with no one there except for a hired nurse. Dick Summers, on the other hand, my grandfather, died in his home, surrounded by his five kids and their spouses, holding hands, telling stories about their dad. One died in a palace in Vegas, with no one there to mourn them. The other one died surrounded by those that loved him. So when the wind and the wave came crashing in, whose kingdom was really made of sand? Whose kingdom are our hearts set? Now, most of us don't pour all of our lives into chasing after fame and fortune. Many of us can be searching for God, but, but still miss God. You see, we can have fixed in our heads how God is supposed to show up and what God's supposed to do, and then we miss it. The Jewish religious authorities thought that they had God all figured out. They had fixed in their head how God was going to come. He was going to come, kick out the Romans, and allow Israel to be on top once again. In Matthew's Gospel, we read that the religious authorities even knew where Jesus was going to be born. He was going to be born in Bethlehem, the Messiah was. Sometimes I wonder, why didn't they act on that information? I think it's because in their heads, they already had fixed how God was going to act. But they just missed it. You see, they forgot that God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Very often, God works in unexpected ways through unexpected people. Often, God works through misfits. As we consider our heads and, and how we think God is going to come, we need to remember that God works through all kinds of people, even smelly, seemingly unimportant shepherds, and through all sorts of circumstances, even a food trough for animals. I mean, God can show up at any time in any place. So why not show up to the folks in the inn, or actually more likely the home, where Joseph and Mary tried to find lodging? Why not show up there? Well, with a full house, they definitely had their hands full. Now you might think, well, that's no excuse. You have your hands full. Why would you tell a pregnant lady to go take a hike and sleep where the animals are? But when I reflect on my own life, I begin to realize that sometimes I feel like I'm too busy for God. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, many of us thought, you know what, this could be a great opportunity to slow things down, 
You really focus on what's important. And in the beginning, things did slow down. But then reality sunk in and new headaches started to creep in. For a lot of folks, God became just another thing on their list that they just didn't have time for. The shepherds, on the other hand, they had hands that were willing to respond to God, God and his call. I mean, of all people, not respected religious authorities, not the powerful Roman government, not even common folks like the innkeepers, but instead these shepherds. These shepherds, they were so despised that their testimony wasn't even valid in court. It makes me think of 1 Corinthians when Paul writes that God uses the despised and the lowly things of this world to shame the rich and the wise and the powerful. You see, the shepherds were definitely considered the lowly and despised things of this world. But God used them. God used them by welcoming them into his presence and then used them as messengers of the greatest story ever told. The story of the fact that God has come down to earth to welcome us into his presence. So how were these shepherds different? Well, they weren't like the Roman government. Their their hearts were humble, not arrogant. When the angel of the Lord appears to them, they don't try to establish their own power. Instead, they humbly are terrified, realizing their own unworthiness. After telling them that they have nothing to fear, the angel tells them the good news, that the long-awaited Savior has come that night. And and the shepherds, they, they didn't have their heads fixed on how God should act, like the religious authorities, instead of discussing what they should do, instead of forming a committee on what they should do about this announcement, they say to each other, the shepherds do, let's go see what God is doing. And they also didn't have lives that were too busy. Their hands weren't too full, like the folks in the end. Instead, their hands were willing to respond. We read in Luke that they made haste, they hurried and found Mary, Joseph, and the baby. And when they found them, they discovered much more than just a newborn baby. They discovered the king of the universe. They discovered the one who has come. The one who has come to let us know who we are, whose we are, and why we exist. And all of this is discovered through a reconciled relationship to God. So brothers and sisters in Christ, As we consider these welcomed shepherds, let us also have humble hearts, minds open to God showing up in the most unexpected places, and willing hands. Hearts, heads, and hands that are willing to welcome our gift of Emmanuel, God with us, all year around. Welcoming him into our lives by welcoming others with his love. Not building our own castles of sand, but instead having humble not already deciding what God is going to do, but instead having heads that are on straight, looking straight towards God. And hands that are willing to serve Him. Hands that are willing to respond to His call. Because when those shepherds, those despised misfits of this world, had willing hands responding to God's call, they discovered something that they never knew before, but when they did, it was all they needed to know. They discovered that that when our earthly wealth fades away, that when distractions go away, that when the hum of busyness goes down, all we really have to give our Lord and Savior is our adoration. Please pray with me. Lord, at the end of the day, all we have to give you is our adoration. So remind us, Lord, how we can welcome you into our lives by welcoming others into our lives and welcoming others into your presence, whether they're in a suit and tie, old, ratty sheepskins like shepherds, or whether they're in overalls. Help us to welcome you into our lives and allow others to experience your love and grace. We pray these things in Jesus' name.